our sponsors. I guess I need to go this way. Yes, can we get to the next one? My clicker is not working. I'm having clicker issues. So we're, we're actually being sponsored here tonight by our friendly folks at Westernized, uh, who are uh, offering the space and the food here for us tonight. Uh, we have some um, beverage sponsors as well, including Moreno Sparkling Wine, and Randy's over in the back corner pouring from our friends from Moreno. Always festive to have champagne at a party, so we really appreciate them being here. Uh, Lagunitas is another sponsor of ours, and we really appreciate their support through the years, as is Nas Energy Drink. This event is being co-hosted with the Producers Guild of America, and uh, we're thrilled to actually be uh, partnering with the Producers Guild. They're one of our favorite partner groups. Uh, we partner with a number of other organizations uh, in the city, and so I know that we'll get Brandon or Susan, who are both here, uh, to come up and say a few words about the PGA and the, uh, the, North, uh, the North, Northern California. Oh, here's Brandon. Uh, so. Brandon is uh, not only a co-founder and president of Westernized. Yeah, executive producer. Executive producer. President, whatever I need to be. He is also the head of the Northern California branch of the PGA. So, Brandon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Great to see such a big crowd. Um, so, the Producers Guild, we are a non-profit trade organization that protects, promotes, and represents um, all members of the producing party, whether you're working film, television, or in new media. So if any of you folks are in that category, I definitely encourage you to come talk to myself or to Susan. She's up there, she knows I was looking for her. Um, and some of the benefits of the Producers Guild are seminars, events like this. Um, we have new media uh, peer groups. We have the Producers Guild Awards, the digital VIP. We have networking opportunities, mentorship programs. The list goes on and on, and there's some literature on the back table over there for everyone to check out. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's event. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So I have to say I'm really excited about tonight's event, and, and I hope the rest of you are as well. You know, it, it's, it's a tenor of our times that we're talking about collaborative stories myths and memes, and while some of these things have been, of course, myths have been with us forever, there seems to be a new furor uh, around these categories and, and a resurgence of examination into these. And the job that my co-founder at Transmedia Staff, Maya Zuckerman, did in putting together this panel is just phenomenal. So I'm really excited. And, and nobody could have really done this better because Maya uh, not only uh, is passionate about myths and mythology, uh, she's also passionately engaged in creating some and, and producing some herself. So in addition to her work for clients like Salesforce.com and Deloitte and & Touche, uh, she's also worked on some really very uh, deep mythological campaigns, including campaigns for Deepak Chopra. Uh, she's working on a project with um, The Fifth Sacred Thing, uh, which is really exciting. We're looking forward to that getting out there. And Saltwater. Uh, so in addition to everything else that she's done and that you'll hear about tonight, um, Maya is going to be leading uh, the Q&A, and so feel free to ask her questions. And without further ado, we're going to get the evening started. I'll turn it over to Maya. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Let's see if I can move us with too much technology. <laughs> so I started this whole curation of this month with um, actually a, a pastiche. This is uh, my idea of stealing somebody else's really great idea. <laughs> Uh, Gary Hayes created a, a map a few years ago, and I decided to recreate it by myself. And it's the map of the transmedia universe that it is today, um, from the uh, submarines of context to the ships of story to the robots of dawn. And by the way, the creator of that robot is here in the crowd. Where is Justin? <laughs> Uh, and the idea of creating where this map of media is right now, because it's not the media that it's not the media of our grandfathers and grandparents. It's, it's a media that is evolving, but it's also um, going back to the way things were. Um, so we used to tell stories like this. We used to sit around the campfire and we used to have an immediacy of reaction from our audience 
and our co-creators because uh, you know as, as a storyteller you have ideas from the crowd and you have people shouting out and that's how we actually had all of our history being told for thousands of years. Now this is the way we tell stories in one day. This is a map of of interactions, uh, 24 hours of interactions around the world. I think this is phenomenal. I think we're actually really going back to that campfire. The immediacy is here. Um, when something happens, we get an immediate feedback loop. And it's really interesting as creators, as curators, as business owners, as brands, how do you actually engage with this immediacy? And I think that's part of what we're going to discuss tonight. And the wonderful esteemed speakers that I have all work with that kind of audience engagement. So let's start with our elders. Um, I think the two elders that I chose for tonight, I think really are the dears of this whole space. And this is, of course, McLuhan. And um, I think in Transmedia, and Transmedia has definitely been saying that um, we're the medium and the message, um, like he is. Um, and it's very interesting how if he was alive today, um, he'd be completely a transmedia creator. He would probably be running big campaigns. Um, you know, one of my favorites, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the Annie Hall, uh, his appearance in, in Woody Allen's movie, uh, where Woody where Allen actually breaks the fourth wall and brings him out to the front and said, to, his, to say, you, you, you know nothing of my work. So yeah, definitely I love, I love him. I think he's amazing. And I actually did a little, this is a part of a blog that I wrote for the Transmedia Coalition, and it's bringing the uh, McLuhan Tetrad that my one of my wonderful speakers, Mitch, actually reminded me about his Tetrad, and actually created a Transmedia one. And the interesting thing about the Tetrad and why it's so it's so now it's so like it was written a year ago, I think, is because of the immediacy of it. The Tetrad uh, tries to actually explain the medium, in this case, Transmedia, uh, and how it is. In how it enhances, uh, retrieves, obsoletes, and reverses any kind of story, any kind of medium, at the, all at the same time. So the idea is, you're reading this, but you need to read the whole thing at the same time now. And I think that kind of um, uh, definition of nowness that McLuhan was trying to convey really works with where we are right now with media, where we are with myths, where we are with the way content is being distributed. I think it's really interesting. That's why I kind of took on a little like experiment in Photoshop a few hours to create this. My other favorite, and I think a lot of people's favorites, is um, Mr. Campbell, the Grandpa Joe. And um, you know, I, I was actually looking, I was Googling, because I didn't know what, like, I was like, maybe I should come up with something, but I was like, Somebody else came up with a meme for all these people, and of course I found some great ones. Uh, and if, if, if or probably everybody knows that actually um, Lucas asked uh, Mr. Joseph Campbell to sit down and actually show him what the hero's journey is, and actually they wrote down uh, Star Wars exactly with the hero's journey with with uh, Campbell helping him. So really, Campbell should be should get him to check. I also have um, uh, one of my favorite sentences, I think a lot of people's Campbell's sentence, Fall Your Bliss. So I have uh, one of our dear friends here who uh, actually did a wonderful TED talk about Fall Your Bliss and where it's be. So definitely check that out, because it actually even expands this whole universe. So the reason I chose this slide to kind of continue this conversation is that it'll take you about 10 seconds to understand that without me explaining anything, right? <laughs> so anybody don't understand this? pastiche, this idea. Great. <laughs> but this is exactly the idea. It's not even, it's a little bit of wording and it's a little bit of font and we get it. We don't have to think about it too much. The loop, the feedback loop is so fast that we know it, we're all in the same conversation and we all are knowing where this is going to. And that's why I chose this one. <laughs> uh, Again, you know, mythology, we think we know what mythology is, we think we know where mythology is going, we're recreating the same archetypes, but actually I don't think we know anything, and that is where we're, I believe we're starting to get stuck in the same kind of rotation of myths and memes again and again and again, that everything is self-referencing the other thing. So, you know, I'm going to point it out. The guy's talking about the guy, Gene Wilder, uh, the uh, uh, Willy Wonka from the 1970s one, 
is making fun of our knowledge of mythology. But it's actually, there's so many different levels of what we understand here that this is mythology thing for me. This is where creating an archetype is a jester uh, who's lots looking back at us at our knowledge. So is our hero's journey in a very quick instant moment of understanding we're all in on the joke. And this one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if this is mythology and creation at a moment, notice, um, the speed of the occurrence of this, I think this was one of the first times that it really went very fast. Um, from the spraying of the kids to all these different uh, artistic explosions of this officer, to I even saw him on t-shirts uh, spraying butterflies on people. You know, it's, it's become so crazy. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's where we're going. I think that's a, that's a very big question is where do we go from here? Now that we've put our big uh, mentor character, our modern mentor character of Yoda with our oppressor from our mainstream, what happens next? So that's a big question for tonight. So we have three amazing speakers tonight. The first one, I want to be is Mitch Schultz. Um, Mitch began his life with journey in Memphis, Tennessee, and has since called Texas, Minnesota, Colorado, New York City uh, as his home. Uh, from early age, his love of art, music, mythology, and anything curiously unusual filled his path, including collaboration with Doris Roberts, synthetic pictures, and development of hybrid collective spectral alchemy. Mitch, will you join us? DMT, the Spirit Molecule. It's a recent documentary that came out. Okay. This is what kind of kicked it off for me. Um, DMT, the Spirit Molecule, became a life's work and energy that I just had to dump everything into, but it also completely changed my life, personally, spiritually, um, as well as an artist. And this is when I started to ask the questions of how can we recode a mythology that's going to be inclusive of everyone on the planet? They don't have to be separate, and we don't have to throw them out. Give them credence and put them together. And I, and I think that um, with this new technology that's been developing, the internet, uh, all of our different devices, I love the time. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> I know, give me two minutes. Next. Perfect. <laughs> um, you know, really starts to give us the chance to connect with people on a much broader scale, share ideas, and hopefully start to understand what our new values value systems are uh, in modern times. So, I get the question of who are you and what do you do? And I'm constantly asking myself the same question. Um, I guess we could say I'm a transmedia storyteller. Uh, I like to think of myself as a culture hacker too. And it's about tinkering with culture, not to break it, but to fix it or make it something new. Uh, as well, I feel like I've done my academics, counterculture. Uh, filmmaker, writer, and everything in between from a PA on set to, uh, to producer and everything. So it's a combination of things, especially in this transmedia world. It cannot be locked down to just one specific thing. And those of you that do work in the media scape, I'm sure you understand what that is, especially in the independent world. So. All right. So like I said, the DMT, the Spirit Molecule film, is what really changed a lot of things for me. The transformation came very quickly. At the same time, it has been a developing process for myself and also for my work. The, let me ask you another question. Many people are familiar with DMT, or should I ask that first? Okay, all right. Briefly, what, what it is, DMT is a compound, it's a very simple compound that comes from tryptophan, uh, naturally produced in your bodies, all over nature as well, from plants and animals, but it's the strongest psychedelic. Um, it takes people to other dimensions. Uh, 
so, so they say, is what we're trying to figure out. Talks to, talking to aliens, talking to entities, and also brings pretty regularly a mystical experience uh, that comes along with that. And it really changes your, your paradigm, or challenges your paradigm. You have to reconsider everything that you thought was real, everything that you thought was right, and everything that you thought was the way to move forward. All of that all of a sudden gets challenged. And that's definitely what happened to me. And it started to change all aspects of my life. Um, just to a simple thing of opening a door for somebody and giving somebody a smile. That right there me can, can have culture in some ways. So then I start looking at this media scape and the internet and the connectivity uh, that we have at our disposal today. There's a lot of utopian aspects that are built into that. Um, at the same time, I think we see a lot of the issues and problems that go along with that. But I think there's a way that we can start to harness that and utilize that, uh, that power and that development to, to start to pull in some of these ideas that have maybe been hidden to the rest of the world, sort of pull them in and see what they can teach us uh, as a Western culture or you know, pulling from other parts of the world that can expand our knowledge base, um, expand our perception and, and our view on the entire world, which I, again, believe makes a new mythology, gives us something new to, uh, to look at the world with. So during this process, I started to come up with what I found, and this does kind of tap into the tetrad here, um, a four-part manifesto that starts to give people an entry point into how we can redefine our mythologies and our ways of being. Uh, that starts with consciousness. And it's that conscious awareness of, all right, who am I? How did I get here? What am I doing? Uh, but knowing that you are a, a being that is alive and well and able to interact, and it's a miracle that we are here. Uh, and and how, are you how are you taking that out in the world and sharing that with other people? Moving from that, once we come back from that kind of self-awareness, what is this 3D environment that we're living in? What is nature? And how are we fully connected to it? Uh, what are we doing to grow our food? How we treat the animals? How we treat each other? These are all important things that I think sometimes we can just kind of get lost in the day-to-day -day grind, and we you know, kind of push that stuff off to the side, but it can be those simple little things that can make a huge difference. The next part is the representation. Once we have that conscious awareness, uh, we, we recognize that within ourselves, we take that back out of the world, how are we representing that? Uh, whether that be through music, uh, painting, dance, everything in between, um, whatever that specialty is or whatever drives you, how are you sharing that with the world? And the last part of this manifesto and kind of the focus is mythology and language and the power of language that feeds into these mythologies and these stories that really dictate everything that we do in our lives. Seems like a very simple thing, but I think again, a lot of us kind of lose track on how a lot of these traditions have ruled us for the last 2,000 plus years. Excuse me, I want to take a drink of my wonderful beverage from our sponsor. Transmedia. sections that I just talked about, how do we start to tap into this technology, share ideas with one another, and be able to open this thing up, see what the similarities are between these different traditions. Um, how do they represent love? How do they represent God? How do they represent nature? What are the similarities there? What are the differences? And why are there differences? What also I think we're starting to see with this technology is we look back into into the past, we start to see that our, our vision has widened a little bit. We have a little bit of a, a scope that is much broader than we had five years ago, much more if we go back a whole century. But there, there's an ability there to, to look back, hopefully learn from whatever mistakes we may have made, look at the positives that came out of whatever that was, and then how we can hopefully take that into the future, uh, again, with an open source approach to get people to start collaborating 
talking um, together and not pushing everything off to the side. It's important that everybody's story is told. This is where I think it, it comes into the power of individual stories. You know, how are we telling our own story to help build this, this bigger collective? So we came back to this transmedia idea. Um, and this open source mythology, what is it that activates people, that brings audiences together, and brings communities together, and that also gives them the power to go do something about that, whatever that issue may be? Um, what are these, who are these activators? Um, I would imagine there are a lot of us in this room that are activators, and what are we doing to participate in that dialogue and to create this new mythology? Maya set me up for this one here. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go into too much of, <clears throat> well, I won't go into anything on the clue right now, but I, those of you who haven't spent much time with this work, I highly recommend it. The man was definitely visionary, saw things way before it happened, and you know, he could have easily been the contemporary today, as Maya said, to, to really write this, you know, the idea of the Tetra. These four projects that are listed here are the the base of, of the, the general mythified manifesto, as I'm calling it. So DMT, the spirit molecule, is about consciousness. Um, again, giving us that awakening or a sense of uh, other or broaderness. Broaderness, is that word? <laughs> Ground of being is the second part of this, and this is going to be looking at sustainability. Uh, in general, just, again, how are we growing our food? How are we treating animals? What are we doing in this three-dimensional space to make sure that it is a sustainable environment? What will be fusion is going to be the art piece. And what we're doing here is looking at the computer as the first global folk instrument. And all of the musicians around the world now are essentially using the computer in some way, shape, or form to share their traditional mythologies and their traditional music. And so we kind of see that travel around the world and then how it's implemented back into the digital space to share with the modern world. And the last one is the open source reality. And that's going to be focused <coughs> on, on language, just Campbell's story stuff, and then getting into McLuhan of what all this means, or potentially means, because we just don't know, but we do have the Tetra to kind of look at possibilities. So this is kind of the basis of Mythify. Um, Mythify is an experience that we're setting up. It's a, what you want to call it, just an interactive experience, but it's a transmedia experience. And what we're doing with all of our projects, no, um, is taking this open source approach to try to broaden this mythology. So we are putting out all of our content via Creative Commons, sharing it with our community, and asking people to go make their own stories with it as well. There's so much content that sits there unused. And as a filmmaker, I'm sure many of you probably know, we use 1% of our interview footage from our interviews in the DMT film. And there's so much great content there, I couldn't imagine just letting it sit there in my home. How do we get that thing out there? And how do these bigger stories, or even more stories, start to tell a bigger narrative. Doing good. Four minutes, okay. <laughs> so the, what we're doing with this Mythify experience is we have these four entry points set up. So we have mind, and then in, underneath each one of these there are three different sections. Mind is for the consciousness or the DMT aspect, or the conscious aspect. Uh, we go into eco, and that's anything kind of earth-based, whether it be mineral, plants, or animals. Um, Muse is the third part of that. Anything that is creative and sort of representation that you're looking at in the world and trying to represent it as some sort of artistic approach. And then the last one is going to be our ethos section. And that's how we start to define what our value systems are in the modern world. Um, I think we all have our individual value systems and a lot of them have been based off of well, I would say some false news uh, that we've been fed through the media and through different power organizations over time, but I think that's starting to shift, and this ground up or this bottom up approach is really starting to be the one that is telling the stories, the actual true stories. So I'm going to run through just really quick. On top of the other three films from the manifesto, besides the DMT one, we have six other films. And Marcy, I hope I'm not speaking out too early here, but I'm going to just Throw it out there. <laughs> um, just run through a few of these. Uh, the Origins of Consciousness was a tour that we did over in Australia earlier this year with Graham Hancock and Dennis McKenna, uh, covering everything from psychedelics to original tribal stories, 
Graham's work looking at uh, cave paintings and what sort of representations were there from our early ancestors and what did they mean? Essentially, what did they mean? Um, Recoding the transformation is going to be looking at culture of festival and transformational culture of festival. What's happening on the edge there? You know, who are the people that are attending these festivals and what are they getting out of it? Who are they in the real world, if you will, and who are they when they come to the festivals and how do those two things merge? Liberation movement, um, Grant, a resurrector here, started uh, heavyweight dub champion and has had some major awakenings in his own work and started to shift now into kind of global musical experience where they're pulling in uh, tube and throat singers, um, Akiros from South America, variety of different uh, instruments that they're creating themselves. And seeing again how that plays out in a personal story but also on a global scale as well. Reconnecting humanity. Uh, Victor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, he had a vision of statue of responsibility. Um, for us to have liberty, he thought, we needed to have a bookend and that had to have responsibility for one another to actually have liberty. So this is underway. They're trying to raise the money now and this will be sitting off the coast of San Diego, a 300 foot statue, the one on the left here with the two hands. <coughs> <laughs> now, we have not officially started on the Tibet Oral History Project, but uh, I've been lucky to uh, come in contact with um, Marcy, do you mind if I call you up? Can you wave to everybody? <laughs> Marcy has started this wonderful organization, I think roughly a decade ago, um, after a human rights presentation that went to the Dalai Lama. Stop me if I'm wrong here, Marcy. Uh, about how children were still, still being treated uh, into that. And one of the questions that Marcy asked was, what can we do to, to make this a different story and, and to really help? And I think Dr. Long's response was to record as many Tibetan elders' stories that we can. And these were people that were part of the original Chinese invasion, followed the Dalai Lama out. And as many of us know, it's, it's very tragic, continues to happen. But this is a culture that is extremely rich um, on many levels. And 170 interviews to date, I believe, is where we are. Um, the Library of Congress is just going to host this thing out. And so there's, there's a lot of potential with that. And we're really excited to potentially start moving forward with that one and, and starting to share that knowledge. Um, and again, in a transmedia space, beyond just here's a documentary, what are all these different interviews? And what is the importance of each one of these stories that fits into the broader culture? Briefly on a deep here, this one is going to be loosely taking the framework from Spiral Dynamics, if anyone's familiar with Spiral Dynamics and kind of the map of consciousness. Um, treating this one more as a Koya Scott's. It's going to be a visual exploration uh, trying to tell the human, uh, humanity's story. So finally, because I know my time is running out, um, my call to action as we're starting to build these things is to start encouraging people to be part of this process. Um, once we start putting our media out there, we want people to get activated. We want them to go out and say what's important to them from this story. How do they utilize that? How do they put that into a new context? Reference it to something else? Find new importance in it and share it with the world? Um, I encourage people to become spiritual alchemists. Get rid of rule sets. We can make our own rule sets. Uh, we don't need the rule sets either. This, this is a, a world of possibilities. There are so many things that we can tap into. And we have been kind of contained in some ways, but again, I think that's opening up. And it's really on us to go tell those personal stories and make the difference um, on the local level. We cannot wait for others to do it, of course. And beyond that, um, I think that's kind of it. I really hope to connect with all of you, and we will be, we'll have our Mythify site up probably in two months. Um, if you have not seen DMT, the Spirit Molecule film, I highly encourage that as a good base point for where we're working from. All these projects are, are socially conscious, and again, putting them out open source, we really hope that that starts to tell us about your mythology. So, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mitch. So now we go to our next wonderful speaker, uh, John McAdoo. John is a founder of City Mystery, a game design company that provides strategy 
narrative implementation for games known by several names, ARGs, transmedia and mission-based games. So City Mystery was a web honoree for Ghost of Chance, a game sponsored by the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the first game to be sponsored by any museum anywhere. John? Games have been called by various names. When I started about six years ago, they were ARGs, ARGs, alternate reality games, and then they became the more, they morphed into transmedia, which I thought was a great leap for media people and would be more palatable for media people. And then I'm sort of working on um, uh, ARGs transmorphing into transmedia, and basically the basic unit is mission-based games. I want to take players out of the game into the real world to complete missions um, and bring them back into the game. So that, um, and I'll show you uh, some, something of the process. So essentially what we're doing in my definition of transmedia is that you blend as much media as you possibly can and each medium is equally weighted. Um, there is no anchor medium and it flows, the story, the narrative, the action of the game flows through as many uh, media as you possibly can come up with. And as I said, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the players to move away from their screens, uh, from their consoles, um, and employ tablets, and employ uh, uh, their phones uh, to be able to actually go out and complete missions. In my games, anything that you do that is attached to the game, the narrative of the game, um, you have to present to everyone else who's playing the game. And the, the whole object of these games is just to move the game forward. And so what I mean by getting people out into the real world is that, um, well, for instance, this woman was completing a mission. She was on vacation in Easter Island. So the game existed everywhere and anywhere, which is a very McLuhan-like thought. The thing about McLuhan that, that really got to me, he talked about acoustic space. And for some reason that has stayed with me since I first read Understanding Media, is that this notion that it was everywhere, it was all encompassing, it wasn't just sitting there and looking in that direction, it could be anywhere, and these games could be anywhere. Um, so this one, um, my point is that how we use missions, which is a, the basic a building block of our games, is that the more you do for the game, the more you unlock the story of the game. And this was our first one for the Smithsonian, and it was a ghost story. And it began this way, essentially. <laughs> a nearly naked man walked into and suddenly appeared at a convention of mostly geeky people. <laughs> and I did it because I wanted a sumo, but the sumo agent in LA was getting a fortune for his sumo people. So I, this uh, convention took place in Boston, and so I, I, I started uh, calling gym rats, and I finally found this man, this Craig Torres. He was Mr. New England, uh, 2006, 2007. This game started in 2008. Um, over his heart was a tattoo, and the tattoo, um, this was great to see because I was standing sort of like over there with his bathrobe, and he was in a posing strap. And they surged forward as soon as he appeared, and they started take, doing what he's doing, and you're doing, just <laughs> taking pictures of every inch of him. Um, and what they found was this iconic image. And that iconic image, um, also this was pre-tweeting, so a Flickr stream started almost instantaneously. So we had another medium involved, and uh, the, they, all the pictures that they had taken appeared on Flickr. It took them several hours to eventually get to this iconic image, which is part of the Smithsonian collection. And it introduced them to a notion of a ghost uh, uh, story. And there were ghosts involved, and they were making mischief. And the mischief that they were making was that they'd gone to the Smithsonian site, the most institutional institution on the planet. <laughs> and they had inverted the typeface. So if you clicked on the typeface, you got to this, which was our first site. 
And our first site, um, we had to cancel this out because it's not live anymore. Um, it was, we asked uh, our participants to do two things. We wanted, uh, that image, by the way, is called a lover's eye. And the best, the largest collection of them, it, it resides in the uh, Smithsonian. So we asked our players to send in pictures of their lover's eye. And it could be a pet, it could be whatever you wish to ascribe as your lover's eye. Mm -hmm. And we also asked them to call in and add their voice to a ghostly um, incantation. And I used the one for Macbeth, and it's double, double, toil and trouble. And you can still call this number and you hear this eerie wave of double, double, toil and trouble. It just, it got so weird and eerie. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we got hundreds of people sending in their lover's eyes. And some of them are just extraordinary. Um, and, and somebody sent in Hal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they really worked on it. And suddenly, what I was talking to you, Scott, about is suddenly your audience is not an audience anymore. They are working for you. They are working for the game. They are participants. They've changed. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, and we had captured their cell phone numbers. If you opt into the game, you give it. We had captured their email addresses. So. Okay, so that's a ham. You remember our bodybuilder? He was the most recent incarnation of the ghost, um, who was a ham actor from 1855. And he died, four of these people died on the same night. And the part of the game is to um, find out more about them so you can honor them, so that you can free them from haunting and you can free the Smithsonian from being haunted. Because we had your cell phone number, this ghost, who was live in the, with a process voice, could call you. And you then had the responsibility of posting that audio, that ghost call, onto the game site. And you could create your own ghost sightings, which is what this video uh, did. And it uh, appeared on Facebook, on in-game character sites. A ghost is with us. <laughs> Missions um, can be delivered by telephone, tablet, and laptop. So they're pervasive. And this is the transmedia part of transmedia storytelling. <laughs> so it's all about engagement and sharing what it is that you've done for the game to keep the game moving forward. Again, this was a mission from our second Smithsonian game. And I also want to say that the museums have been, especially the Smithsonian and the Luce Center, way out ahead of the curve. Because some of the work that I've seen here in previous meetings have been based on franchises, like television shows, or something like that, expanding what ex already exists. What the Smithsonian was able to do was to take it on faith partly because I have gray hair. But they, they allowed me to just start telling a story in this brand new way. And I look at my museum work as complete proof of concept that you can do it and you can attract thousands and thousands of people to do it along with you. So you're all moving the game forward. This is another example of a, of a mission. We ask people to digitally insert themselves into this painting. I like the one in the middle because she actually texturized herself and really made herself part of it. Ah, and now from the sublime of Mr. Schultz, which is very, very necessary to the very practical, what is the sponsorship model? Where's the money? And the money remains as old as radio and television. It's a sponsorship model. And the sponsorship is different. This time around, you're not going to sponsor the story. That's TV and radio. You're going to sponsor what people do for the game. 
you're going to sponsor the missions. So in this one, um, the proposition, the mission is, get yourself invited to someone's house for dinner, sing for your supper, and have your host take you. Do it, and then you post it. Okay, but then you want to bring your host a present for having uh, sponsored uh, your, your performance. So you bring a bottle of champagne, and you co-sponsor um, with wine.com. And the game becomes the point of sale. You can make a sale in the game itself, and in the sponsorship, the mission tells the brand story. So with wine.com and with champagne, you're telling the brand story, but you're advancing the game as well. This one, um, these are all real missions that we did for our second game. Um, narrate your route to work as if you are a professional sportscaster calling a football plays. And you videotape yourself doing this, or you're you know, the first person shooter. And um, if you use any of the For Dummies products, about football or coaching or anything like that, and the point of sale, you get additional points and you rise in the game. So you see how sponsorship can work. This is uh, another one where, uh, again, you're offering point of sale. You're doing it as fancifully as any 20-second commercial on TV, except what you're sponsoring is the fun that people are having, and your product is the way they're having the fun. So in this one, uh, WebEx invites you to form a network of players in Los Angeles, Minneapolis, and Baltimore to bake a cake. You're doing something silly, but you're applying it to an actual sponsorable brand. So, some of our games. Um, this one um, is the first one I talked about, which is Dose of a Chance. And, and I won't uh, click on any of these, but um, these are all the different media that we did use. I had a calligrapher calligraph um, an 18, a 19th century hand, a male hand and a female hand. We had real letters of distressed paper. We mailed them to players that we liked. We chose a player, we snail mailed him, and then he had to post it on the blog that was dedicated to this game so that everyone could share in it. Um, we had to make things. This one made the fortune cookie as predictor of imminent doom um, because we asked for things of imminent doom. And I, we also were giving them a show at the Smithsonian, but when the uh, game ended, they uh, had a dedicated show to all the things that they had made. Um, on the lower right-hand corner, this man's a forensic um, anthropologist, and I went to him, at the, and he's at the, uh, the uh, National uh, Natural History Museum on the Mall in Washington, and I said, um, I, need a char I need a dead character. Oh, what do you need? Well, she's a uh, 24-year-old African-American, a runaway slave. Um, she was hit by a train. He said, I've got it. I'll find the corpse. <laughs> because the Smithsonian has a room that was donated by a, 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 a surgeon in Philadelphia who had nothing but bones, corpses. And he fit one together for me. Again, the people who attended the live events, our games have live events which creates theatricality in the games. So we have about 25 to 50 people who attended the autopsy. They took pictures of it, they posted it, everyone shared in it, it moved the game forward. And we also use cell phones, do as well, cell phones. Um, the Colonial Williamsburg, which is in Virginia, Californians don't know much about it, and they know Knott's Berry Farm, but Colonial Williamsburg is this very famous thing that was started by the Rockefellers, <laughs> and it was one of the revolutionary cities. They have live events. This was a game, um, oh, I should have said, The Ghost of a Chance ran for six weeks. This game runs for an hour and a half. Involves the same amount of media, by and large texting, um, because on a four-day spring break holiday time, 6,000 players generated 50,000 texts. So they're really engaged. They're also making things and doing things as they go along. Uh, this is another 
discovery of mine. Most of the games when I started, when they were called ARGs, were single sponsored. The networks 60 years ago figured out, oh hell, why do that? Get you make more money if you have multi-brand sponsors. And, and that is the proof of concept of Fion, which is really built around a graphic novel. Um, I, we don't have to see it. But it's just missions sponsored by five separate um, brands, essentially. Uh, Brewster uh, Kale's Internet Archive and the Smithsonian Encyclopedia of Life, which some of you may know about, which is attempting to digitize all human, uh, I'm sorry, all natural matter on the planet. Um, and the Loose Information, uh, the, the Loose Center, the Loose Foundation, and the uh, University of Maryland's College of um, Information. Each sponsor of the Smithsonian most of all, because they were the prime, they were the lead sponsor, they sponsored several dozen um, missions, all having to do with their brand, all having to do with their collections and their work. So transpose that, extrapolate that to cars, food, clothing, and institutions. These games aggregate. You aggregate audiences. That's what you want to do now. We move from broadcasting to horizontal programming where each channel was. You used to program up the program day, right? 3.30 to 5.30 was women watching soaps. And then Walter Cronkite came on at 5.30 or 6, and that was men. And then the evening was family and then adults. And then cable brought in horizontal programming. Each channel was women, children, men, on and on and on. That's what we're in now. These games, through the missions, ask you to blend all of your audiences. So it's no, it, you're, you're sharing audience. It's not audience share anymore. You share the audience. Uh, this was a client in Germany, and I just unveiled this. This is a template. I was just talking to a guy named Bob about this, that delivers, oh, there you are, Bob, um, delivers missions in packets um, around specific skill sets. And I'm designing these for education and for corporate training. Our client is AAA, a, a German corporate training, um, and we sell and lease these. Um, and they, um, the back end in includes expiration dates, so you have to finish them within a certain period of time. Well, this is me again, and um, our team and our advisors. And I didn't take you to, uh, um, I, I didn't take you to uh, online to, uh, but you can find archives of all the games uh, that I've described. And that's my story. No collaboration of the audience. Um, the next and final speaker is Ash Mooney. Uh, he grew up reading classic folklore and fiction such as Tolkien, Chaucer, and Grimm. The stories, fables, and parables inspired him. Um, Ash has started a new game company, Fulgrim Bros. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about what he's doing there. It's really interesting. Uh, Ash. Darker themed, fairy tale inspired games. 
Now the great news here is fairy tales span the entire world. It's not just Grimm Brothers. It's not just you know uh, you know the Chaucer tales. It's it's everywhere, right? So a lot of this bleeds in from mythology, from folk tales. Um, and you can see that some of these are, are classic tales that resonate from one culture to another. So we're taking a lot of these themes, these ideas, and reincarnating them, making them more accessible, making them modern. And we're going to look to build a cross-platform community going after core gamers and mid-core. Why core? These are people who want deep, rich experiences. So this is not a game that you play because you're bored and you have five minutes to kill. This is you actually seeking out a deep, rich, interactive content and being able to do that with friends. Ooh, uh-oh, let's go back one. All right, excellent, got it now. So our main approach is, uh, in many times in the gaming industry, someone releases a game that's a standalone product. It's singular. Um, you rise, you fall, you do well, or you fail, right? We're doing a different approach. What we're saying is, let's create a community. Let's create these fairy tale themed inspired games and we'll link them to each other. And so we're going to do this through cloud-based technology and make sure that when people engage in these experiences, that we're catering to modern habits, right? You can't just uh, have games on smartphones and tablets that are hours and hours long. It just will not work, right? You have to cater to what people want, their attention span. So we're creating bite-sized game sessions with cross-platform multiplayer. A great example of this, uh, I think words with friends, right? Very easy, boom, 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 sending words back and forth, and maybe you have multiple games going at the same time. That's kind of the idea, that's kind of the experience level, the level of engagement we're looking for. People can drop in and drop out. And as, of course, with games like that, you want integrated messaging, so you're able to connect with the person that you're, you're gaming with. If it's just blind connections, then you're not really doing anything interesting. So, uh, and we see that the most interesting thing for us is the PC and tablet community and linking those with our games. There's been a lot of examples of people who have done this in the gaming space. Uh, a lot of different products that are fantastic, Battle Bears, Team Fortress 2, League of Legends. But all these are just pinnacles uh, of one platform, mostly PC or their, their uh, PC or uh, smartphone, right, iOS. They don't actually try to bridge the gap between the two. So, I'll just brief over this. Been in the industry for about 14 years. Uh, broke my teeth on a lot of big EA titles. Ooh, go EA! And um, I've been all over the place. Uh, a lot of it uh, by design. Pretty much learned every aspect of game development, from the publishing to indie development to uh, midstream levels. So let's go into the actual game concepts. And our whole idea here is we're giving them a different flavor of a gaming experience, right? This is not revolutionary. Let me be clear about this. This is chicken cordon bleu all over again. But with some wasabi, okay? <laughs> it's tasty. It's yummy. You're going to enjoy it. Because the idea here is that games are meant to be consumed. They're meant for people to get in, have a great time. So let's, let's do that, but with our own little twist to it. So this first uh, product that we have going on, it's codenamed Dungeon X. And the elevator pitch is Tim Burton meets Dungeon Crawlers. So if I use a lot of gaming terminology, uh, please forgive me, I can explain after the show. But basically, what would happen if Tim Burton was given a small development team and went wild? Uh, well, this is probably what something might come up with. And so uh, we're inspired by the, the grim classics, such as uh, Little Red Riding Hood. Our character is named Red Robin. So take it, a little bit of a twist, it's public domain. He's, everybody's doing it, right? And uh, sh this character has deep claws. So what makes her more interesting is, um, think a uh, redneck hillbilly. H hillbilly with like a serious drinking problem, right? <laughs> this, is, this is Red Robin, and we think that's, that's kind of interesting, right? That's kind of that's funny. So uh, there's a little video that goes along with this. Kind of shows one of the story missions that we have, that we're running with. <laughs>
from Beetlejuice, so thank you, Dan. Uh, but as you can kind of see, kind of playful, kind of dark, a little bit of black humor uh, in that little clip there, that little kind of sizzle reel. Um, Red Robin, this is one of the many story missions, but she owns a, a rum factory. And one day her workers rebel, stealing all her booze. And so she wakes up in a hungover mad craze, and now she's looking to murder the uh, particular people who stole all her stuff. In Very fun, wholesome tales. So this is a, what's now following is some of the game concepts that, that are coming after uh, Dungeon X. So this one is inspired by Cinderella. Now, excuse the lack of clothing. Uh, this is her actually escaping from the test laboratory. Uh, for gamers, uh, think Infinity Blade gameplay meets Victoria's Secrets, right? But the story idea here is very interesting. Uh, we're again taking a lot of symbolism from Cinderella. And if you look at Cinderella, it's actually quite grim, uh, pun intended. Um, the sisters in the story uh, chopped off parts of their feet to try to fit into the shoe. Right? The shoe was so coveted. And so here, the shoe is this kind of parasitic, alien, demonic arm, as you can see on, 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 her, on, her, on her body, that's grabbing from her supernatural powers. There's also some scars on her back. And Cinderella is actually one of the oldest, goes through multiple cultures, but she's a hero. She's a hero character. Eventually, she does find clothes. Uh, don't worry about that. But, um, you know, again, these are things that inspire us. We're saying, what can we do to take this and make this modern? What can we do to make this different? What can we do to make this relevant and cool? So the next one is Arbor. Uh, some of you have seen, uh, maybe in the movies, or even heard about the Hansel and Gretel witch hunter people, right? Okay, that's a, that's a nice interpretation. Ours is a little different. Um, from, so for the gamers in the audience, we're taking Castlevania gameplay meets Mass Effect. Mass Effect, that's a multi-story, choose-your-own-adventure, right? You can choose to go A, B, C, align yourselves with different people, choose different missions with different repercussions. But the story idea here is, again, involved from uh, Hansen Gretel. You're an outcast law enforcement that discovers an orbital platform that is not what it appears to be. And so just to, to give away some cheats here, uh, the orbital platform, that's the house, that's the candy cut of the house, because it's giving this precious fuel from this planet. Right? And that's what attracts all these kind of people and seats to it. And there is, there is an oven as well. Next one. Oops, no, nope, we're back. Nightwatch. This is inspired by the Canterbury Tales. If uh, that's familiar to anybody, these are, all, all these people are on a pilgrimage. And all of them have stories. And some of them are liars, some of them are corrupt, some of them are idiots. Naive, noble, they all have some strong quirk. And we said, that's interesting. What if we combine these people in kind of a life and death situation? Uh, I think Left for Dead, but a little more black humor, right? Uh, or maybe The Walking Dead, if that's more relevant. And so that's what it is. You have this monster clue of these flawed characters for, to, forced to uh, fight and survive together. This is my favorite one. Uh, this is Mariner. Uh, inspired by Moby Dick. And uh, for the game, the game pitch is Half-Life meets Final Fantasy boss fight. And so, uh, the story idea is a possibly mad survivor of a shipwreck or I'm dealing with a dive suit and a lifeboat is going against the Great White Devil. So, this kind of changes the whole idea of what Moby Dick is, right? The symbolism is still there. Uh, just like Isaac, he's, he's mad, he needs to destroy this thing. But is he sane? Is he crazy? Right now we got a little octopus that's kind of cracking the lens on his visor, so you know something's not right there. So all these games, again, are inspired by fairy tales and fables, but where, where does the transmedia aspect come in? Well, if we're starting with gaming, and that's our core medium, we, we feel that it's a natural progression to, to segue out to these other, other transmedia outlets, whether it's just uh, goods, promotional goods, uh, videos, anime, manga. So one thing that we're doing to grow our community is having persistent elements. So trophies, crafting, rare items, just things that you do in-game matter. It's not just you get in, you get out, and thanks for playing, right? You get able to accumulate these things and carry them with you. And as we accumulate these, tro these trophies, these crafting, these rare items, this is an opportunity for us to, to create these into transmedia products. 
right? So top players that do a really great job and get the epic set of armor, well guess what? We're gonna send you a figurine, right? It seems cheap, seems like a ploy, but it works. You're rewarding the community for engaging. You're rewarding the community for being a part of it. Uh, gifting and challenges via ghosting. So this is an interesting idea. And again, it's nothing new. But basically, uh, people can gift other players. It's a social viral thing. Everybody likes getting free stuff, right? So you can give your friend some help. But how we're doing it in some of our games is, when you play a video game, guess what? You're going to die. It's a matter of a video game. It's going to be hard. But what if you could take, every time you die, what if you could create a ghost? And what if you can then do things with that ghost? Talk to it. Oh, God, that was really dumb of me. I really wish I didn't use a, you know, a a wooden stick on a giant werewolf that just didn't work on me. But you can actually send that ghost to help another friend. Or you can send it to haunt another friend. Right? So again, it's the same things that we that the mechanics are already there. They're challenges, they're gifting. But it's in a different way, and it's more personal. Because now it's your friend. You get to see all the things that your friend does and all the stats that he has. And it makes you want to maybe compete more or share more. Right? And this is this becomes a nice mechanic for, again, growing the community and making it sustainable. Uh, User-generated content via missions. So again, this kind of feeds up into the persistent elements, such as crafting. So you're going to craft that epic armor set. So you can actually be able to post in what would be almost like an auction house. Say, hey, you know, I really need six dragon scales, right? And I'm willing to pay you a thousand gold per dragon scale. Well, that's a pretty good cost, right? Um, so you go off, you complete that mission, and you feel like someone, both, both sending it out and receiving it, is rewarded. You're rewarded because now you have materials to craft that epic armor set. And the other pers 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 uh, person in the community uh, gets the, the actual financial reward. And they both had fun doing it. Right? That's a very, very interesting thing. Uh, Community-based skill contests. So, uh, very famously, League of Legends does this. These are actual cash prizes, huge events, thousands of people attend these, right? You see these gamers, they get their headsets on and they're all into the game. That's exactly what we're going to look to do, but maybe not on that scope, right? We're going to actually have skill-based contests. And we'll, again, reward them with actual, not only monetary goods, but physical goods. Hey, here's a t-shirt and a check for $1,000. Good job. Keep on playing. And last but not least, you know, we're going to listen to the community. Uh, we're going to do polls, we're going to do events, all online to really kind of get their feedback to see what they want to see next. Right? We do believe each game has a life cycle, but that being said, you can greatly extend it. Right? So expansion packs. Maybe everybody's really excited about Steam steampunk. Okay, steampunk it is, and here it comes. As long as, as it's modern, relevant, and it still fits in the world that we're creating of these kind of fairy tale themes, uh, we think the users will really enjoy this. And so again, our, our core base is games, is this online platform, but the tendrils can reach out everywhere. Okay, that's it. Now, I think I'm waiting to be QA with the other panelists, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So unless somebody really wants one question while we're setting up. Burning desires, anybody? Any desires? Bueller, Bueller. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. interesting and when we are thinking about how to create an evening about mythology it's not an easy subject because the subject is so big and I think these three are a great segment of what's possible uh, and a great in, there's a great intersection of all these different worlds of what's happening with the way we're creating mythology um, and I really enjoyed this thank you guys thank you So I've got a few questions, but if anybody wants to ask, please um, raise your hand. Um, I think I'm going to start with, we'll start, I think, with a question for the three of you. Um, how do you harness the masses to create the new mythology and make our projects, our platforms, successful while still keeping the integrity with your audience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I think that's probably an evolving thing, something because a lot of this is so new. But what I've noticed from my, my experience and some of my work is 
as I mentioned in my talk, it's the, it's the activation. What is, what is that piece that is really, really important, whether it be to a community or a niche group or just an individual that's going to get them excited enough to go out there and participate in it? And, you know, I think some of those topics, whether it be sustainability, whether it be consciousness, art, a variety of different things that, uh, that we may not even know about. Uh, but it's something that is truly valuable for that individual to push them. Um, and one of the things that we want to do with this Mythify experience and this interactive aspect <coughs> is give people a possibility to make a living on this site. So we put all of our content out there, and yes, it's exciting for them, and it's something that drives them and wants, you know, pushes them to go make a change. But now they can also have distribution of the product that they just created on that site. So now it's not just something that is a, a personal desire, but it's also a way to, to bring income into them as well. So I think that can also be a way to, to get people moving a little bit. But there's also that conscious element to it as well. So you're going to go do some good, but you're going to go uh, make a little money and, and survive. So. So um, discoverability is a huge, huge issue. Um, how do you gain an audience? How do you start the community? So one of the things we're doing is we're taking all the traditional media that's out there. So we got YouTube, we got websites, we got everything. And we're saying, OK, well, why do you do the same thing that's been done before? So we're just going to gamify everything. Uh, so we're looking at YouTube. And we're saying, hey, how can we gamify YouTube? Do a brief, maybe 12-part series where maybe users can comment or vote on what the character does next. OK, that's kind of fun. What if we launch a website that's actually a, a story? And in order to find out what happens next to the story, it segue and actually leads you into purchasing the game. Right? Again, this is nothing new. This has this all been done before. But it's just a, the approach of it, right? It's having a unified approach. Um, the biggest thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we're not nickel and diming the, the, the users, the players. Um, you know, the freemium movement is huge, it's here to stay, I made some freemium games, I have friends who made a lot of money in that space, but that's not what we're doing. We're offering kind of deep, rich content, and we think that by itself, uh, executed well, is going to be a strong lure. And then we just got to make sure that we get the, in front of uh, the right users. So we're not doing the shopping approach, we're, you know, advertising all these channels. We're going to selectively pick one, two, three channels, vocal, core players, Gamify the channels, the things that we are doing, the websites, uh, the YouTube videos, and then and then grow from there. So, one of the things that I'm thinking of um, is that, um, well, stars and sex, and those are traditional elements that, in a way, are parts of the story. And I'm trying to reach out for very mainstream kinds of storytelling in lots of ways. I want, to, I want you to be involved in the stories that I create, but I also um, I, I want to make the game to be part of every inch of the promotion of the game as well. For instance, with the first game, with the Ghost game, um, ABC.com interviewed me, but I only would agree, and they wanted to, somebody to come out and take a picture of me. So they took a picture of me that I said I would only have a picture that had a clue embedded in the media, so that it was pervasive, and the clue was there for anyone to see who was playing the game. A ABC, actually, that was a, a magazine. Then ABC.com did a story, and I said, well, the only way I want you to be able to click on something in the photograph that you're going to use of my um, logo for the game, and that's going to give you an audio clue. So I'm surrounding you with the game. Um, and then what I meant by stars and sex was, I am a movie buff, and I grew up on TV and movies, and the kinds of games that I see um, reflect a certain interest of mine. But, and I say this at a lot of meetings, I want musicals. I want um, romantic comedies. These games have room for that. And once we start doing that, 
then these are going to become much more mainstream. I literally want people, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking with a former partner of mine um, who writes for Broadway, and he said, well, how do you do production numbers? I said, well, that's easy, that's crowds, that's, you know, that's really easy. And he said, well, yeah, but what about the expertise? I said, well, at the core, you have great dancers who are doing the flash mob that, every, you know, that everybody else is doing. Uh, and then he said, well, then how do you do um, intimate moments? And I said, well, that's done on the cell phone. You're calling players with intimate scenes because it's one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, everything is posted to the game. So does that, I mean, that's what I'm doing. I want to surround you with the game. That's all great answers. Sure, so th those are uh, pending, so I'll share with you the results as soon as we do them and let you know how well it worked out. Um, but both, uh, I think our two main efforts right now is the website and uh, the YouTube series. And then um, on top of that, we're going to go look to do uh, presence at conventions, uh, Comic-Con uh, and uh, PAX. And what we're going to do there is kind of, is anyone in the audience familiar with cosplay LARPing? Yeah, there we go. So again, we're going to gamify that as well, right? So, and, but again, maybe one of the, the, the characters will be Red Robin, right? So we'll provide Red Robin, and you get to be one of the monsters, and go. Green Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, John, I was wondering, in terms of the, the games that you've been doing, and you've been—it's um, really—I love that you've been using physical spaces. Um, I haven't seen anything with geolocation. Not that your games need them at this stage, but have you decided? Have you is that, a, is that a conscious decision, or is it something that you want to do, or, or has someone that works? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything, anything is um, possible with these. Anything, as long as you can craft the the narrative to be sort of uh, uh, you know to distribute. Through geocaching, let's say. Sure. Um, but yes, and, and the other thing that I always feel is that, that my games are always potentially global. Always. And um, again, as you're aggregating audiences, and that's a niche audience, those people who, who follow that, then yeah, go after those. So it's always, you know, it's often budget constraints, too. I was just about to ask what, what uh, there are any obstacles in No. I don't. And, and, and I think the stars part of stars and sex that I was talking about was that th these games can also involve that because that opens the audience once you've got somebody. This Broadway game that we're trying to put together, for instance, I want to use real recognizable people and use their lives um, and lie about them <laughs> and, and create parts for them, but but you know, but they're playing themselves. Mine's um, for Mitch. You're, you're a, an advocate, I guess, of DMT. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Wouldn't be an advocate. <laughs> so how do you see it playing into discovering mythology, your own personal mythology? How is it something as a tool to be used? Or what's its, what's its use? Um, I'm always cautious with being an advocate, necessarily. It's, um, for one, it's, it's an illegal compound, um, so I, I don't want to go out there and, and tear yeah. people to go out and, and use this. Um, I also don't think it's for everybody, um, but what we have seen throughout history, people have been using these compounds, um, and very much so for mythological purposes, and to connect with ancestors, the other side, whatever that is. Um, <clears throat> And I think there's, it gives a lot of purpose, it gives a lot of meaning to the rest of the world around you, um, beyond just that conscious state of, you know, the only way of saying something is connected. Well, you really get that, um, you know, under the influence of DMT or ayahuasca. And it's not just a saying anymore, you get to really physically feel it, um, emotionally. So, it, I was living a pretty fast and reckless life um, 
before I had my experience with it. And it changed everything within 10 minutes. There was a lot of putting the pieces back together because you don't just have an experience like that where everything gets shattered. Um, and then you come right back out and you're like, okay, well, the world's different. I'm going to go on out my way. I had to start to figure out my personal mythology. You know, what was, <clears throat> what was I doing in the world? How, I, how was I treating my, my friends and my family? How was I treating myself? Um, so I think there can be a way for psychedelics and entheogens, whatever the term is that people like, to, to help them get in touch with themselves, but also get back in touch with who we are as human species. Um, I think we've separated ourselves from nature. We don't feel like we're a part of it anymore, that we can control it, dominate it. And I think that's been one of the biggest parts um, of our destruction as we're starting to see. We can no longer do that. It's not a sustainable practice. Um, and those, and, and I don't think that it's have a chance that these things are starting to pick up right now when we see all these institutions collapsing. People are starting to look for answers. Um, the political system's falling apart. Religions are falling apart. Um, and people have had that comfortability there. And now they're going away. They're, they're learning there's a lot of, of BS behind some of that. Um, so I, I guess to round back around, I get back around to your, to your question, I don't go out and say that everybody should go do this by any means. Um, I do look at, from my own personal experience, what it's done for my life, um, and also what has happened because of Dr. Strassman's research uh, with the DMT, is it has now opened up research again in the United States and in the Western world for that matter. So they're looking at LSD trials for cluster headaches and migraines. They're doing post-traumatic stress work for soldiers and women that have been abused with MDMA. Um, there's ayahuasca work that's coming up. There's new DMT research coming up. So this isn't just a bunch of hippies getting high. There is an actual purpose for it, and people are actually reconnecting, uh, with, whether it be their own personal mythology, whether it be their mythology or their religion that they came from um, growing up, or a new discovery of a personal mythology. It, it changed. It changed me, as I said, and, and I, I speak from that space. Today, than anything. So, thank you. I'm glad I answered that. Yes, actually, one question that I definitely have is: um, we're having all these tools, we have these games, we have all this technology at the, at the tip of our hands, and a lot of times, what happens is also with UGC, and you probably all have had that experience. If you put out your content for people to actually use and to their own interpretation and it comes back very negative. And uh, you know, we had a Google guy a few months ago, I think in September, and they said they had an interactive animation tool online. Came back the next day, 24 hours later, and all the drones were penises. <laughs> and they had to actually start actually putting something into the engine to actually see how they can make it you know, more, uh, you know, PG and all that. Uh, so, when we have all these tools at the tip of our hands, how do we actually empower the users to create positive stories, create a positive mythology, create a positive outcome, even if you know we're dealing with the darkness, but how do we kind of get into the light? Does, does that happen? Is that an issue that can be resolved? Or we are always going to have both the sides of the, of the coin? But I think a lot of the times what I see is, I think right now what we're seeing, especially with the happenings that happened in the last few months is that one really bad experience happens and the internet answers with a lot of positivity, some negativity, but a lot of positivity. But as curators of our platforms and as creators, how do we how do we help our audience get there? So uh, when you release a game, uh, there's always a disclaimer that you have to put at the front of it that you know uh, online experiences may change your game. Right, uh, it may not be the same. So even though it's T-rated, if someone's going to start yelling profanities uh, online, well, you can't control that. Um, so there are some things you can do. It really depends on per platform. So one is you do embrace everything. It's, it's wild west, and you appoint uh, the community as sheriffs, right? So you say, you, you're an admin, you're an admin, you're an admin. These are people who are part of the community, and you say, hey, if someone's mouthing off or bad behavior, you can ban them, right? So you empower the community to do that. The other, the other way to go about it is, um, and that's, you, you see that often in the PC space, 
uh, in the mobile space, like iOS, you're going to have to do uh, what I call a cookie cutter solution, which is you can't allow people to say whatever they want. But if you can pick from drop downs, hello, I'm grumpy, I want this thing, and I'll award you this amount of gold for it, and this is your reward, and this is some kind of snarky emoticon I'm going to put on there. So you've given them enough tools to be self-expressive and create new content, but it's with a very limited, pre-selected uh, array of comments of things you can say and do. So you can still have some personality, but it's, it is uh, restricted. Um, my team and myself have been thinking about this a lot, um, especially coming from the conscious media space. So what our whole purpose is to go out there and start to make some, some tangible changes in the world um, on a variety of different levels. So right off the bat, I'm hoping that just the content itself and the purpose gives us a good starting point for that. Uh, the curation aspect is how we're seeing this thing starting to evolve where people that are involved in each one of these projects and then just people in the community, Alex Gray or Graham Hancock and other people that we, that we partner up with, um, having them kind of push content out, push out their creativity, get people involved on top of our content and their creativity. Um, they can help start to guide some of this um, and hopefully it builds that base. I'm also on the line with though, that there is, um, once we start doing, some, once we start censoring, um, I believe that kind of becomes an issue as well. Um, so how how do you walk that line of letting things take place um, and then letting them work themselves out, uh, which I think is part of what we're trying to do in the world all the time. Um, but I think the community, as you said, it really starts to come back to the community and we encourage the community to speak up when somebody does something that we don't feel is in alignment with what we're trying to do. How do we get Joe Lowe that's in the middle of nowhere but is a very active community member and it puts in a lot of positive aspects to this experience? Um, give them some of that power to say, hey, maybe not ban them, but maybe so, but what can you do to switch your language a bit, have them take a different perspective, and then let the rest of the community know that this is not okay or this isn't something that we will support? on a regular basis, and hopefully that alone starts to change people's perception and gets them to utilize the media in a responsible way. So. I like that word that you said, this is something that we cannot support on a continuing basis and let it be less for So Yeah, exactly. No, that was really good phrase. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm dealing with this in my community too, and I find that bad people, it tends to come back to you like a ghost. Absolutely. They're really ghosts in the way. It's, it's some people will seek out there are a lot of trolls out there. <laughs> and that's the troll personality, but it's also sometimes a, a very creative personality that somehow, a friend of mine has said, is kind of an unsocialized puppy. Mm -hmm. You just have to learn other strategies to gain attention. Sure. And we've seen a lot of tragedies in the last few years in society people like that. Mm -hmm. So, especially in a creative society, we don't we really want to put it push people to that edge. Uh, so I'm wondering if in the community, when you have left it up to the community, so people come up with something more creative than banding, banding or more complex. I mean, when I was working with kids years ago, my first job, one of the things they would do is uh, somebody violated the rooms, they would, they would be timed out, kind of a banding. And they had a place for them to be timed out. And then, then there would always be remorse among the community banning them and someone would say, well, this is too hard, I'll go sit with you. Mm -hmm. And then, then they would actually physically bring them back into the group and they decided the time was up. Mm -hmm. I looked it up to them. Can we out. just actually reflect back, and I'm sorry, we should give Claudia a mic. Oh, just, can you quickly reflect back what she was saying so that everyone can share? Uh, I was just addressing the idea, I really like the flow where this conversation is going about what can you do when people sort of act out or is a label is called a troll. Because I've had, I've, I'm dealing with that right now in my community. And I think banning is something that just um, doesn't necessarily give you the result you, you would really like. So what, what other creative things have people done? 
besides Fanny. Thank you. Um, just two quick comments. Um, and one example of this idea of banning, I, I don't know, everybody's probably familiar with Ted. Uh, Brian Hancock just did a talk on there recently called The War on Consciousness. Well, he mentioned ayahuasca, and Ted pulls the talk. It was no longer allowed on Ted. Ted is about opening up new ideas and exchanging new ideas. The War on Consciousness, and then it gets wiped off. Um, the community was up in arms. Like, why, why are we taking somebody that's coming out here and, and then we're taking them off and we've already invited them here to come do a talk? And I've come to the place now and, I, and I've kind of seen it because of this and, and some other things that I, I trust the community. Uh, there was a, a story recently that on social media, amongst all of us, there's, there are more positive stories that are being put out than there are on the nightly news. Makes sense, but something that's just gotten touched on. So I'm starting to feel like we want change in the world. You know, even if you live on the far right and you have this particular viewpoint on whether they need from fracking to, to take some money from people, we as a community and we as a global group, I think, want change. I think for the most part, the numbers are changing to, to make a difference there as opposed to continuing the same. Kind of downward spiral. So jump, jump on that. But that was something that jumped so out to me. It was trusting the community. Well, to, to kind of pull the community. Got another uh, question over there. It's a, it's a question entirely. Okay. Uh, my question is for John. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like there's sort of two ways. Yeah, it is because the games were never uh, planned to be that linear or to be um, enacted in one place. Okay. They emanated from the museum. Actually, one of the interesting things about the Smithsonian Games was that one of the things, the first, the only thing that they wanted was footfall. They wanted bodies coming through the doors. And what they didn't understand, and the most successful thing that we gave to them was that we inhabited their digital space. And they never even considered that their digital space was habitable. So, um, so it's not necessarily, um, uh, you know, the bricks and mortar. It's not the pla It's not place location. I mean, you can have great live events. You can do very surprising theatrical things um, where where you ask people to mass and, and do things. But basically, games, real transmedia for me is it starts at a live event, it morphs to your cell phone, it goes to your tablet, it goes to your desktop, it goes back to a museum, it goes, you know, it's, it flows, it just all flows. Right, okay. Acoustic space, right? Acoustic space. Let's, let's like, as we round up to finish uh, the evening, um, Couple more questions. Um, actually, I was you know, looking at Ash because I wrote down a question, and then you, you even uh, show that you're actually also going to have Hansel and Gretel. And I was looking at uh, how much grim there is out there right now. How many grim tales? There is the grim TV show. There's Once. There's Snow White and the Huntsman. There's Mirror Mirror. There's Hansel and Gretel. There's but, but sorry, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, and Get Baked. The same year. <laughs> Uh, and now your awesome game world, and it's, it's beyond just grim. It's this return to folklore, return to mythology, you know, from Buffy and Xena to where we are today. There's, and it's a question to all three of you. Why are we still in the same stories? We, and I know that Jung actually they mapped the fact that we all are here, you know, we map our consciousness around heroes, mentors, jesters, and of course, uh, Campbell took it to the hero's journey and really showed the, the prototype, the blueprint of, of mythology, of myth. But you, from your different aspects, why are we still, still telling the same story? And are we ever going to evolve from the story? Or, or maybe a better question is, how do we evolve to the next story? Um, so I'm going to give the academic answer first, and then what I believe is the commercial answer second. Uh, academically, it's the human experience. Uh, the whole spectrum of human experience, the range of emotions we, we engage in, jealousy, anger, love, torment, suffering, longing, 
all these feelings, uh, the parables, both dark and good and bad, uh, you know, uh, trusting others, not trusting others, uh, you know, hard work pays off, cheating doesn't. These, these are parables mixed in with the human experience. So um, a parable is a, a story with a lesson, but with human actors. A fable is also a story, but it has animal actors, you know, uh, magic, stuff like that. So this is, so that's the academic answer. The commercial answer is uh, Hollywood, uh, the game industry, and everyone in entertainment, unfortunately, we're in a highly derivative industry. People, and this is psychologically based, we buy what we know, we buy what's familiar. If someone presents you a dish that you've never seen before, it kind of smells good, but you have no idea what kind of meat is in it or vegetables, you're probably not going to eat it. You're probably going to be like, oh, that's interesting. But if it's something familiar, oh, okay, that's chicken, but you put pineapple on top, ooh, that's different, then you're, you might be more or less susceptible to try it. We're hungry for content, we're hungry for new things, but we're not going to go that far from what we're, we're familiar with. So that's why there's all these sequels in the game industry, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 4, you, you know, all these World War II games, you keep seeing them, and World War II will never go away. You know, you're going to keep seeing this again and again, and you see the shift back to fables, because again, this is something that collectively across multiple cultures, we're familiar with, right? And so all we do is take that familiarity, tweak it, and guess that, oh, it's suddenly new. Let's do the Grim TV show, right? And so that's, that's my answer. <laughs> um, the, the reason I was drawn to the games um, that I have been working on is that they, had, they were the first games that I found that had beginnings, middles, and ends. And when you have beginnings, middles, and ends, then you're back to the metaphysics. And you're back to the notion of heroes and villains. And um, so that's something that's core, that's at our core. And those make stories possible. So I think that's why we keep pulling from, from those. Um, to amplify what Ash is saying, my years working in and around Hollywood, everyone thinks that LA is a very progressive place. It was the most reactive town I've ever lived in. And we were just talking about this before uh, this afternoon. It's the anomaly that is the hit. The anomaly is the hit. And then they spend the next two decades ripping off the anomaly. It's much easier to do it. Um, and then I have one other thing, one observation I had. Um, and I don't know if you would agree or not. But, I, um, but 2008 really affected me. Um, uh, the finan what happened with the financial um, industry and, and how much it still controls and how big this does control our lives. Because I, I suddenly awakened one day and I said, what is all this vampire and zombie stuff? Why is, what is going on? And I suddenly realized we are playing out. We all know. We are. We know we're not in charge. And that Goldman Sachs is the vampire squid. And do you know what I mean? And we know it. We know it in our gut. And creators know it, and the audience knows it. And everyone is gravitating toward it because it's a story that at the moment makes a lot of sense. That you're being eaten a lot. And there's not much you can do about it except have the hero with the stake, or uh, what kill zombies? Do you just shoot them? Oh, right. All right, so, all right, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that was my observation about it. And I think, by the way, I think it's fading. And I, I uh, because I think the awareness, I think Occupy drew on that, and, and uh, was a very, very important educational tool and demystified the financial community so that people could understand it. And the more knowledge and information you get, the less of the bogeyman is, is out there, the more power you have. So, and I like the fact that it's morphing back into fables and fairy tales and, um, uh, because those seem to have a pureness of storytelling. And the zombies and the vampires are interesting enough, but but they, uh, I, I can't explain it. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating that it all suddenly became zombies and vampires.
Well, with the zombies and vampires too, I think um, you know, really over the last decades, I've been kind of watching the media scape. There's been a whole emergence of supernatural style storytelling, uh, where I think as science starts to open up some of these new dimensions and new possibilities, um, we need to start putting those into our stories. And I think the return to some of these original fables and some of these original allegories are in response to that. That's what our ancestors were trying to do. They were trying to understand what was happening in the natural world, uh, putting some sort of face on that, whether it be an animal or whether it be a thunder god or um, Robin <laughs> from the um, I, But I'm under the impression that, yes, there are core stories that are there, but I do believe we are telling new stories. I think we're already there. We are an emergent population our technology, our consciousness, uh, our society, we are constantly growing into something new. There are more and more possibilities, it's more and more complex. And although we're using these past stories, they are different. They have their core, there are new possibilities, there are new outcomes that are built into those. Um, and that we don't have to be controlled by just this, again, top-down approach. Um, we all have our personal experiences that are just as powerful as HBO and these other stories, big storytellers that are out there. And the technology is now there that we can share those stories and reference these fables or reference some other stories that have been traditional throughout all cultures, um, but now start to share them on a broader scale. So I think we're good. Yeah, I think we're good and we're finally. So I like to thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Shedding some of your wisdom. Yeah. Uh, thank you all. We have a few more announcements, yeah. so don't get up just yet. Partners place at Yeti Zen Innovation Labs, not too far from here. Uh, so look for these emails and join us. Uh, Transmedia staff for a discount for the first one, and the second one is completely hosted uh, and sponsored, so uh, it's free for cover page. And uh, we we also I don't know if Paul is here. Whitney had to leave. Uh, have a third workshop that we're announcing. Uh, focusing on brands and ads, and Whitney is a brand master, uh, worked at Apple and Google, among other, uh, but I think that she spent like 12 years at Apple, they know how to market themselves. And they're really great at transmedia and selling their brand. She's going to be teaching a uh, workshop on transmedia brands and how to uh, create the transmedia process around your brand. So again, you can use the discount code Transmedia SF for that if you're interested. Oh, finally, looking to announce our next meetup. We we'll hope that you'll join us for that. And that is going to be, again, on brands and ads and campaigns. And we're doing that at the San Francisco School of Digital Filmmaking. 
which is over at 925 um, Mission Street. They're another one of our partners. Happy to be working with them. And so we'll look forward to uh, seeing you there. It, it's, you know, the workshops, obviously, they're workshops. Uh, there's no beer and wine. We do provide some soft drinks, but you know these networking events. We we're really looking forward to getting everybody out, and we're happy to see the big crowds. So we hope that we see you. Uh, this is a slightly different date for us. We usually do the last Monday of the month uh, because the last Monday of May is Memorial Day. We know you'll be busy. Uh, we're doing this on Thursday that week, so we look forward to seeing you there. Oh. Thank you, and oh, well. We always need help. <laughs> and uh, if anybody wants to work with us, uh, help us, we're looking right now for web designers, bloggers, and content managers. We're going to be upgrading, we are upgrading our website, and we really want to start having much more rich uh, experience, kind of experience on our website. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you. Um, also, we're looking for guest bloggers. If anybody is interested to posting on our website, it goes all around. Uh, we also have a lot of community, the global transmedia community partners that we can uh, repost blogs to. So talk to me or talk to Beth afterwards and thank you very much. So so thank you. But one other thing, you know, we, we invite our members of our community to come up and announce their transmedia projects. And you can sign up to do this on our website. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, and anybody else that wants to 